You know, I want to tell you a story. So there was this man uh, who went to the forest and he was taking a walk there and then he saw an eaglet that fell from the tree. And so he looked up, couldn't find the mother eagle. So he decided to take this little eaglet and brought him home. And so he had a farm and he placed this little eaglet uh, in the chicken coop. And this eagle lived with the chicken. All right, grew up with the chicken, ate the chicken food, chicken feed, you know. And soon, it was like walking like a chicken. And it started to pack. It started to pack the, the food, uh, you know, uh, on the ground, like how a chicken would do. So, even though it was an eagle, it lived like a chicken. So, one day, there was this bird expert, a naturalist that came to the farm. And he saw this eagle amidst all the chickens. And so he asked the farmer, Hey, farmer, why is this eagle, the king of the birds, here living among the chickens? And thinking that he's a chicken. So anyway, the, the, the farmer said, You know, I raised him, even though he's an eagle, he doesn't know he's an eagle. Uh, you know, he's lived with a chicken all his life. He's quite happy with the chicken feed. He's quite happy with his chicken friends. And he lives like a chicken, nothing wrong with that. And so this naturalist said, no, 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 it cannot be. It is a magnificent eagle and it should live as an eagle. So he took the eagle, the time was quite big already, and said, now fly, stretch your wings, king of the bird, and fly and soar like an eagle. And then the eagle was quite alarmed, what are you doing, you know? And he looked down at all the chicken and decided to come off the hand of the naturalist and went back to packing the food, the chicken feet that the chickens were eating. And so said, no, no, no. The naturalist said, no, no, no. This bird is the king of the birds and it should soar like an eagle. So he brought this eagle, carried this eagle all the way up to the rooftop of the farm. And on the rooftop he said, now, eagle, you're king of the birds. Stretch forth your wings and soar into the sky. And then this eagle looked at him, looked down at all the chicken in the chicken coop and decided to flap his wings and went down to the chicken coop again and eat the chicken feet. And then the naturalist said, no, 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 no. It should not be. So the naturalist brought that eagle and went to the highest mountain he could find. And this eagle went to the highest mountain and then, you know, the sun was there and, and this, uh, this naturalist said, you know, stretch forth your wings, you king of the birds, and soar into the air. And so this eagle looked at him, looked down at the valley where he used to be, at the chicken coop, then slowly he stretched out his wings. It was a huge wingspan. And then it flapped. And then it took off into the sky, never to return again. You know, the eagle discovered his identity that he was the king of the birds and he no longer returned to the chicken coop to behave and to live like a chicken. You know, today I'm talking about identity. I'm talking about your identity. Are you a chicken or are you an eagle? The answer is eagle. No, not very convincing. Uh. Some of you think you're chickens. Uh. Really, God has called you and I to be eagles, to soar. That is our identity. It's so important that we know who we are in Christ. We need to know, you know, what Christ thinks of us, how we should behave, what is, you know, our characteristic, what we need to do. And so this next five weeks, we're in a new preaching series called Identity. And we will unveil the different identities that we have as, as, uh, as, as Christians. All right, this week is the Church of Christ. Do you know we're called the Church of Christ? And what does it mean to be the Church of Christ? Next week, Pastor Jenny, we are called children of God. That's another identity. What does it mean to be a child of God? And it goes on. We'll talk about five identities that we have. And if we live out those identities, you know, we're going to be powerful. We're going to be glorious. We know who we are, what, what Christ has called us to. And then we live that victorious Christian life, influential in this world, doing the works of God in our lives. Can somebody say amen? Amen. So are you ready for the three characteristics of the church of Jesus Christ? Turn to your neighbor and say, you are the church of Jesus Christ. 
All right, three characteristics of a church of Jesus Christ. The first is this. The church of Jesus Christ is set apart for Jesus. Set apart for him. And we take the verse from Acts chapter 20, verse 21. It says this. I, who is Paul, right, have declared to both Jews and Greeks, that means Jews and Gentiles, huh, that they must tr- turn to God in repentance. Everyone say repentance. And have faith. Everyone say faith. In our Lord Jesus Christ. Basically, this verse tells us the two criteria that is needed to become the church of Jesus Christ, to be set apart for Him. First is repentance. Second is faith in Jesus. Everyone say two components. All right? It's important to know that salvation that we have today is not by works, but by grace. Do you know that? There's nothing you can do to save yourself from your sin. Absolutely nothing. It's given free by the grace of God. And what we have to do is put our faith, put our faith in Jesus, which is the second component of the Bible verse I just read to you. Put your faith in Jesus, ask Him to forgive you of your sins, invite Him into your heart, and you are saved. But really, salvation is not by works, but by grace, through faith in Jesus Christ. And this is found in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. And nine. But in my sensing, as I prepare for today's sermon, uh, I'm not going to talk about the faith portion. Because I believe most, most of us have had that faith in Jesus. That's why you're a believer. Most of us have said the sinner's prayer. Am I, am I correct? That somewhere along the road, whether you're a kid or you grow up, you said the sinner's prayer to receive Jesus. You don't have a problem with that, putting your faith in Jesus. But what I'm sensing the Lord is leading us to for today's sermon is the other component called Repentance. Remember, two components, repentance and faith. So I'll leave faith another day. It's a very important component, but I don't sense the emphasis for today's sermon. But I want to talk about is repentance. Repentance. And millions of people have, re- have, uh, have what we call um, uh, received Christ in that sense of, of putting their faith in God. But the question is, how many have truly turned from their sins to walk with Jesus? You know, we want the benefit of heaven. We want the benefit of the blessings of God, don't we? My schoolwork, no no good. Oh, God, Jesus, please help me, help me do well in my school. Oh, my business, no good. Oh, Lord, please bless my business. Oh, you know, if one day if I leave this earth, I thank God that I can go to heaven. So these are the benefits that comes with faith in Jesus. And we all love that part of salvation, isn't it? But how many of us have truly done the first part, which is repentance. Which is repentance. Let's look at this uh, definition. I have uh, different definitions, but I found that this was one of the best that, you know, uh, that explains what repentance is. And it's from Wikipedia. You can Google that. It says this. Um, it's a call to make a radical turn from one way of the life to another. It's a summon to a personal, absolute, and ultimate, unconditional surrender to God as sovereign. Next slide. It is a change of mind that involves a conscious turning away from wrong actions, attitudes, and thoughts that conflict with a godly lifestyle and biblical commands and an intentional turning away, doing that which the Bible says pleases God. In repenting, one makes a complete change of direction, a 180-degree turn towards God. Next slide. Okay, maybe it's missing. In repenting, in repenting, oh, no, that's it. Okay, in repenting, one makes a complete change of direction, 180 degrees towards God. You know, friends, repentance is not lip service. We only talk only. But repentance is really a change of heart and mind as well. Can somebody say amen? It is about being made holy for God, being set apart for His purpose. So actually, how many Christians have truly repented of their sin by that definition that I've just read to you? It's food for thought, isn't it? And it is no wonder that some churches look like the world today because there is no separation from sin. 
And I know and I pray that it is not with RCA, amen? That we are a church that's separated from the world. We are the church that's truly repented, amen, for the glory of God. You know, it is, it is sad to hear of statistics that the divorce rate in the church is, is just as high as the world. It is sad to hear that there is gossip, slander, pride, jealousy, envy, greed, selfishness, unforgiveness, idolatry, even happening within the church. It is no wonder that the power of the Holy Spirit is so often not in, at work in the churches around the world because of the lack of the fruit of repentance. My prayer for RCA is that we will not be a powerless church, amen, but we will be a powerful church because we're set apart from the world. We live different because we repented of what we were before we knew Christ and today we live for Jesus and that is the power of the church, a transformed church for the glory of God. Amen. And that's what is needed. Not just saying the sinner's prayer to have the good things, you know, that comes with the gospel, but also the repentance to say, Lord, I'm willing to be separated from the world. I'm willing to repent of the sins of the past and no longer have that baggage in my life and walk with Jesus Christ powerfully because I am a church. I am part of the church of Jesus Christ. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3 to 5, it says this. Let's take a look. But among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talks or coarse joking which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving for of this you can be sure, and I underline this, no immoral, impure, or greedy person such as, such as a person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Wow, it's very, very clear, isn't it? And by the way, Paul wasn't talking to heathens. He was talking to the church. And this repeats itself in the different books of the Bible. All right? he, he, he didn't only say it to the Ephesians, he said it to the other churches as well, similar passages. He was talking to Christians. He's saying if they continue in willful sin, like was listed earlier, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Which means they won't go to heaven. No? Think about that. We have to get the wrong mindset out that once safe, always safe. That is actually not a correct teaching that has been going around. Oh, you just say the sinner's prayer, no matter what happens to you, no matter how you behave, uh, you're going to go to heaven. That is actually a, a false teaching. Because clearly from the word of God that I've just read to you, that if you continue in willful sin, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. God will call you to accountability. God will call you to accountability for your life doesn't mean that you are sinless and you're perfect. It doesn't mean that. But it means that our hearts are turned towards God. And whenever he convicts us of our sin, we must repent. And I, this seems to be a hard message, but I want us to know this truth because I want to preach the truth in this church. Can somebody agree with that and say amen? Amen. 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 One time I was doing street evangelism. This is some years ago. And we always go street evangelism, you know, and I would lead the team to do that. And I, I came across this lady, and I, of course, shared the nice part of the gospel. You know, you need, well, you believe in Jesus, you're going to go to heaven. You believe in Jesus, your sins are forgiven. You believe in Jesus, God is going to bless you. Your sins are washed as white as snow. Do you want to believe in Jesus? And so this lady said, yeah, 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 why not? I want. Then I was so happy. I said, you know, okay, great. I, got, I caught a fish <laughs> in that way, you know, saying, and then I, I was about, can I say a, a prayer with you? Of course, that prayer is a sinner's prayer, right? I wanted to say, um, you know, let's pray together. Then, then she was about to say, close her eyes. Then she looked up at me and said, hey, by the way, uh, I, I live the alternate lifestyle. Can I still be a Christian? And I said, actually, if you really want to believe in Jesus, there is that part of repentance and faith. 
So actually, you have to go by, live by the word of God. You cannot have your cake and eat it in that sense. You have to repent of this lifestyle if you want to be a true Christian. I told her plainly. And then she told me, thank you very much for your time, but I'm not ready. So she wasn't ready. Because even a pre-believer understood that she needed to be separated from the old lifestyle, separated from the world, before she could truly be the church of Jesus Christ. She knew it. I wonder if Christians know it. I wonder if we know it as well, that there is a price to pay. Many of us are willing for the nice part of the gospel, the blessing. But how many of us are willing to pay the price to say goodbye to the old lifestyle, the life of the flesh, because it does not please God, and to live for Jesus Christ wholeheartedly. So repentance is so important. I know at this point in time, some of you are feeling, oh, I feel very hopeless uh, because I'm struggling with sin. But do not feel hopeless. Do not feel hopeless because I've got good news for you. God helps us in this process of repentance. Let's look at Romans chapter 2, verse 4. It says this, Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, Paul says, forbearance and patience, not realizing that, I've underlined that, God's kindness is intended to lead us to repentance. You see, God calls us to repentance by His kindness. By His kindness. It isn't His wrath that scares us to repentance. Hey, yo, I better not, you know, God, God, better not get killed by God uh, uh, and, and, and repent. But it's, it is His kindness. It is His love that gently leads us to repentance. That's so important to know that. God does not condemn us because of our sin, but He woos us to repentance by His love. And today, if you feel condemned because of your sin, let me tell you something. It is the devil that puts it there. He puts the guilt and shame in your life. And that is not from God. God doesn't condemn us, but He convicts us of sin. So you may ask, what's the difference between condemnation by the devil and conviction by the Holy Spirit? Here's the difference. You listen to this, and the next time, God will give you discernment to know whether this voice is from the devil or from God. When the devil condemns us, he will tell you you're a bad person, Seb, you, you are a bad person. You're good for nothing. You, you are hopeless. Lah. You cannot make it. And it makes you feel bad of who you are generally. That's condemnation. You feel so guilty, so shameful. And the devil puts that on you. And God does not do that because in Romans 8, 1, it says that there is, therefore, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus does not condemn us when we are in him. But he convicts us of sin. What is Conviction. Conviction is this. Have you ever, like, in the time of prayer, in the time of worship, when you come towards God, and guess God suddenly show you a picture of what you did yesterday? How many of you have experienced that? And you know that it's sin. I have. Uh, time of worship, right? I was, eh, suddenly, eh, yesterday, uh, you look at something at Facebook that's not so good. Uh. Something like that. It, it's very specific. God convicts us with something very specific, and he tells us that is the sin. And when he tells us that, we don't feel con condemned in that sense, but he tells us that is wrong. And that's why we need to repent of it. That's why he says, oh God, forgive me, wash me right now, wash me, wash me, uh, you know, with your precious blood, wash me with your word right now, so that that sin is covered under the blood. That is conviction. That is the difference between condemnation and conviction. Do you get it? So the next time you will know where is it from, who is it from, and we know how to repent, amen. Conviction is very, very specific, whereas condemnation is very general and it makes you feel bad about yourself. The other good news is this. The other good news is this, is that change comes gradually to us. Change comes gradually to us. It is called sanctification, all right, this big word. But it means that we become better and better, we become more and more holy, we become more and more like Christ. It is a lifetime of the Holy Spirit convicting us. It's like an onion that you peel off layer by layer, allowing the Holy Spirit to peel off the sins in our life. And then at the end, we become more 
and more like Christ. You know, how many of you, can I ask, uh, you became completely holy, completely Christ-like, absolutely behaving like Christ the minute you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. Put up your hand. No one, right? I remember when I first believed in Jesus, uh, I'm still full of the old self, the sinful nature. I just believe in God. You know, but what happens is that the seed of the Holy Spirit has been deposited in me to overcome the sin in my life. But from a, at the start, it's a gradual process, isn't it? It took years for me to be transformed, for my mind to be renewed, for me to get the Word into my life so that I can be transformed by the Word, so that I, I can obey the Word. As I learn the Word of God, it is a gradual process, not a sudden process. So all of you, all of us are work in process. Would you turn to your neighbour and say, you are a work in progress. But the important key is this, if you fall, pick yourself up again and keep walking. Sometimes it's, it's, it's three steps forward, but then sometimes you, you fall back one step. Get up again and keep going. Keep going in the direction that Jesus leads you to. Amen? Amen. And never turn around and walk towards the devil again. Never do that. But you know, sometimes we stumble and fall, but we get up. Jesus, you help me. The seed of the word is in my life. The seed of the Holy Spirit is in my life. I just keep get up and I go and I go and I go and I become more and more like Jesus until the time we return home. In fact, we'll never be perfect until we get to heaven. But in the process is sanctification. But we must have a heart of repentance. We must bear the fruit of repentance in our life. Because that's part of being separated. Part of being set apart for God. Besides faith in Christ, it's repentance. Amen. Are you learning something this morning? Are you learning something? Those that are online, repent. Having the fruit of repentance always as the Holy Spirit convicts us. Submit to the Lord when He prompts you. Quickly repent and then make a decision never to do that again. All right, that is repentance. And I felt strongly one application for this besides leaving that old life behind is this. Let's look at that slide. Application of being set apart is to be water baptized. Is to be water baptized. Acts 2.38 says this. Peter replied, repent in the same sentence, and be baptized. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sin, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. One application of being set apart is your willingness to be water baptized. Do you know something in the Bible, if you look through the New Testament, there wasn't one person that wasn't water baptized? You go and search, huh? There is no one that was, I received Christ, yes. And then, are you baptized in water? No, no. All that was not baptized in water, they will get baptized. It is part and parcel of the process. Everyone who believes in Christ is water baptized because water baptism is an identify, identification with Jesus Christ. It's your identity. It's your identity as the church of Jesus Christ that you are water baptized. Baptized. And I pray today that those that have not been water baptized or maybe your kids have not been, it's a good time to talk to them about or yourself as well, that you ought to be water baptized. And this year, our water baptism service will be on 27th of November. I'm praying that many, many people will be down underwater here. There's a pool up here and that's where we water baptize people. So if you're not yet water baptized, I encourage you to be water baptized because that is in line with the fruit of repentance. Amen. One person. Amen? Amen. 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 Number two, are you ready? Very quickly, I know we're out of time. Is to be like him. First John 2, 6. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. The second characteristic of the church of Jesus Christ is to be like him. We must walk the same way in which he walked. In other words, we must be his disciples. We must be his disciples. You know, the church of Jesus Christ must be serious about following Christ and be like Him. In fact, the church of Jesus Christ should be full of disciples that think like Him, speak like Him, behave like Him, and love like Him. Amen? We should be little Jesuses that look like Jesus on this earth. So the question is, how do we do this? It is through the process of discipleship in which RCA is determined to do. We are disciple 
making church. And very quickly, there are four things you can do to be like Jesus. Acts 2, 42. They devoted themselves to, number one, the apostle teaching. Number two, the fellowship. Number three, the breaking of bread. And number four, prayer. Devoted to the apostles' teaching is when they go to church and they receive the preaching and teaching of the pastors so that they are fed by the word of God. Fellowship is building relationship with one another in the church. And in, in our context, it would be like a care cell. Number three, breaking of bread. They took communion often. is like what we did this morning, communion. Number four, prayer is that they were often praying individually but also praying in prayer meetings in corporate prayer. If you want to grow and become like Jesus, if you want to grow and be a disciple, if you want to grow and be a true church of Jesus Christ, you have to do these four things. And when you do these four things, you will become the disciple of Jesus Christ. But I don't have time to go into detail all of it, but today I'll just go into one, one of the four pillars, which is to sit at the apostles' feet. Acts 5.12 says this, The apostle performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. You see, Solomon's colonnade is the physical lo location of their church. They went to church every day. How do I know that? Acts chapter 3, when John and uh, Peter was on their way to, you know, uh, the, the, on the way to Solomon's colonnade to pray, the church. They met with uh, this, this man that could not walk and, 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 and healed him, right? This, so they went to church every day at three. So church was every day. Church was every day. And that's where they learned the word of God from the teaching of the apostles, the pastors, the prophets in that place that they, uh, that they were. And the word of God transformed their lives. Friends, in this COVID-19 pandemic, it is so important that we come back to physical church to hear the teaching of the apostles, to partic participate in the worship service, to worship God and sense His presence, to come and fellowship here in church. It is so important. In fact, they met every day. We're only meeting once a week. Yet, we don't come back every week because of the pandemic. But yet, it's so important that we come to church. Amen. Can I hear an amen? amen? Yeah, it's so important. I know you're watching online, but I invite you to come. It's very, very different. We know the difference between on-site church and online church. And I encourage you, Risenites, to come back to on-site church because the experience is so different. I want you to take a look at uh, this picture, the first one. Can you see what it is? Can you tell me what it is? Birds, right? Hmm, quite beautiful, huh? These birds are so beautiful, and they're, and they're seated so closely together on this branch. And let's take a look at the next picture. What is this? Uh? Also birds, right? Small, cute birds uh, sitting all so close together on a rope. Tiny birds. You see, what happens is this. In winter, it's so cold in some countries that... If they do not huddle together, the birds actually die. And so they studied this. And let's take a look at the birds again. This is just one of the pictures. The one in the middle, those few in the middle, scientists have discovered they are the ones that survive the winter because the warmth of all the other birds around them keep them warm. And then the birds at the end, right, the two end, right, have a slightly higher chance of dying because there's no one on one side. And so they could die of cold. And they also studied that those that never bother to huddle together has the highest chance of dying in winter. This is a fact. And it is the same with us. It is the same with us. If we are not huddled together as the body of Christ, though now they say there's a meter thing, like, you know, social distance, physical, but, but it's so important that we huddle together as the body of Christ, isn't it? Because the one in the center is going to get the warmth, the heat, and have that spiritual revival. Those that are at the corner and the side uh, have a less chance, and those that don't even huddle together are most likely to backslide. And this pandemic has been going on for one year, eight months, nine months, and it's still going. 
And uh, I was asking a pastor friend of another church, and she was telling me that up to now during the pandemic, only 30% of the congregation has come back to their church. 70% has not been to church for over a year. And we're all wondering about the spiritual condition of the 70% that has kind of disappeared, not even knowing whether they're online or not. This pandemic has a way to bring us away from God. And that's why as Christians, it's so important that we huddle together like the birds right in the center. Get right in the center of the pack so that your fire, your, you, you will remain revived in the Lord. Amen. So it's so important we come back together as a church. And that's the point that I want to make for number two. Number two. Number three, serve him. Matthew 28, 19 to 20, it's pretty quick. Let's have the musician, or rather the keyboardist come up. Matthew 28, 19, 20, familiar verse, the Great Commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The characteristic of the Church of Christ is this. Number one, after you are set apart for Him through faith and repentance, after you become like Him through discipleship, you must be released by Him to serve His purpose. This is the three characteristics of the Church of Jesus Christ. Rick Warren, okay, the famous uh, pastor US, said this. In The Purpose Driven Life, he wrote this. It's not about you. The purpose of your life is far greater than your own personal fulfillment. Your peace of mind or even your happiness is far greater than your family, your career or even your wildest dream and ambitions. If you want to know why you were placed on this earth, you must begin with God. You can Google this. The greatest purpose you can do is to devote your life to serve Him in the Great Commission. That's what the Church of Jesus Christ is supposed to do. At the end of the day, when you go to heaven, God is not going to ask you, hey, so how much money did you make? Ah? God's not going to ask you, how many degrees and postgraduate degrees did you earn on this earth? God is going to ask you, how many souls have you won to the Lord? Have you been salt and light of the earth as I've called you to? Have you been a man and woman of influence while you're here in that short lifespan, 80, 90, I don't know, 100 now, nowadays, on this earth? How have you spent your time? Is it for self or for the kingdom? And here in 1 Thessalonians 2.19, it says, what, what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of of our Lord Jesus, when He comes, is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. Do you know one day when we go to heaven, we will we'll receive crowns? Heard of that, right? I preached about that earlier this year. The crown we will receive in heaven is actually the souls of men and women we win to Christ. And this crown is for eternity because the souls of men and women are for eternity. So invest in something that will last forever. That's the soul of men and women. That's serving Him. That's the great commission that the Church of Jesus Christ is called to. So let me challenge you today to spend your time. Yes, you've got to raise kids, you've got to work. We, we know that, you know, we've got to make a living and all that. We understand that. But let us be soul winners and disciple makers while we're here on earth. Starting from your home. Make disciples in your home. Make your children disciples of Jesus Christ if you're married, have kids. Then work towards the extended family and friends, the oikos you know, and then to the ends of the earth, the nations. We have a mission call as well, not just here in Singapore, but all over the world. And the Bible says in Matthew 24, 14, and where gospel shall be preached to all nations, all ethnos, means all people group, ethnicity, and then the end shall come. Jesus ain't going to come back until the gospel goes into every tribe and nation in the earth. And that is what the church of Jesus Christ is supposed to do. 
the Great Commission. And let me end with three promises that Jesus gave to his church. Number one, he is with us. We're not this, on this earth alone. Matthew 28, verse 20. Surely I am with you always. That is the, one of the most powerful promises. No matter what you do, God is with you. He will never leave you nor abandon you. Number one. Number two, we win. Second promise is we win. Matthew 16, 18b. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Jesus fights every spiritual battle on our behalf. So in the end, we win. Doesn't matter what you're going through now. In the end, we win. That's the second promise that Jesus gives to us. Number three. He's coming back for us. Wonderful, isn't it? Third promise. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord, that's the rapture, in the air. And so we will be with Him, with the Lord forever. One day, He'll wipe away our tears, all the struggles we have, and we will be reunited with Him and we will celebrate with Him forever in heaven. God has called us to be a glorious church. Amen? A glorious church. Are you ready to embrace your identity as the church of Jesus Christ? Very quick summary. Three characteristics of the church of Christ. Number one, set apart for Him. Number two, be like Him. Number three, serve Him. With every head bowed and every eye closed,